And suddenly you go from like being absolutely broke to in one day, Zerv telling me that they had never seen record sales like that go from maybe about five, 10 to five to nine in the morning, literally until midnight. They were just coming in, coming in, coming in. Welcome to the Torpreneur Podcast. Travel industry veteran Shane Whaley will take you on a journey with fellow torpreneurs, sharing their tips, ideas, insights, and success stories to inspire you to make your tour business the best it can be. And now, please welcome your host, Shane. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 19 of the Tourpreneur Podcast. Great to have you here today because I bring you a conversation with a media superstar. He's appeared on the Travel Channel, in fact, several times. He's appeared on Good Morning Britain and on NBC's Today Show. His name is Tony Muir, and he is the tourpreneur behind a slice of Brooklyn bus tours. Now, this interview is a cracker because in true Brooklyn style, Tony does not hold back, okay? He gives it to you straight from the heart, straight from the guts. He tells you why he's concerned about OTAs. He talks about the importance of paying it forward. He shares with us how mentorship with other tour companies in New York City helped him to grow as a business. He also takes us to that moment when he sat in his car outside his parents' home, his head in his hands because his business has run out of cash and he didn't want to go back to healthcare. There is so much in this episode that we did go over the hour. I hope you will uh, understand why, because this is a very authentic, genuine interview, and I think there's a lot of things in here that are going to inspire you, motivate you, and you're going to be nodding your head to a lot of this. So let's, uh, let's cross over to Tony Muir of A Slice of Brooklyn Bus Tours. Forget about it. <laughs> So everyone, I'm joined here in New York City uh, by Tony Moyer, who is the man behind a Slice of Brooklyn Tours. I've just come off one of your buses. The wonderful Paula has just given me a fantastic tour around Brooklyn. I really want to hear the story of how this all got started, Tony, how you started up your tours and, and everything you've learned around, on your journey. Um, so how did you get started with the tour? Oh, it was a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. <laughs> no, I started in uh, 2005. First, let me say thank you for this opportunity. I love Torpreneur. I've been listening to the podcast and there's some really informative stuff. And I, I think for our industry, for those of us that are sort of deep in the trenches, doing what we're doing. It's refreshing to hear how other people are dealing with the same things we're dealing with, only we don't think that anyone else is dealing with. Yes. Them. So thank you, first of all. I started my company in 2005. I started the company for a couple of reasons. One, I couldn't do healthcare anymore. I was in healthcare. I was a respiratory therapist. I took care of trach patients on ventilators. I did it for 20 years and I loved doing it, but I got burnt out. Uh, you can't be around 20 years of death and dying. And that's why I give people like nurses and doctors so much credit. Uh, they're amazing people. I couldn't do it anymore. However, traveling in the 90s was my thing to do. I worked 12-hour shifts here in Manhattan at St. Vincent's Hospital. And I traveled extensively in the 90s, whether it was the United States or overseas. I found out that people were fascinated with Brooklyn. You know, I often would go off the beaten path and I would like to meet locals. And that's how I travel. I think a lot of people like to travel that way. And people would start asking me about Brooklyn. Maybe it had to do with an actor or a singer or a movie like Saturday Night Fever or a pizza or the Dodgers or Coney Island. It's a legendary place, right? Um, and I would start to tell people and describe it in those ways where movies were filmed, maybe some mafia history, things that, you know, people wanted to know. These people, I mean... You know, uh, uh, it started, I'd never forget, I was in Bath, England. You know, I took, I was traveling by myself. I went to go get a haircut and was talking to, you know, John, the haircutter there. And he asked me about Brooklyn. And then when he came to Brooklyn, I picked him up at the airport and drove him around and showed him my Brooklyn. And it consisted of some pizza and the view down by Fulton Ferry Landing, which, mind you, is not the tour. It was not the tourist spot it is now. It was a ghost town in 2005. Um, and so, but, but this was pre-2005. This was the 90s. 2005 is when we started the tours. Um, and I would take them to these places that they would have never thought of going, would have never been able to go. I noticed that there were things that were definitely a hit. And then every once in a while, if I pointed out a movie location that they had no clue about, it didn't really work. And I'd say, wow, if only I had the clip to show them, et cetera. Little by little, 
not only did the people who I met and showed me around their hometowns that I escort around Brooklyn, but then they would send their family members and ask right. if I could show them around. And I would just say, listen, I'm not asking for any compensation. Pay for my gas. I'll take you around, you know, and show you. That's how proud I was of being a Brooklynite. And, and you know, I, because I'm from Brooklyn, I happen to think that there's a strong Brooklyn pride, but we all have pride of where we're from, right? Brooklyn just happens to be a place that really ha- has an amazing sort of famous and infamous history. And for some reason, it's part of people's consciousness. So um, I started doing that. And to the point that my friends started joking around and calling me like this ambassador to Brooklyn, yeah. they'd ask me what I'm doing on the weekends. I was like showing people around Brooklyn. And then one night at a party, I was, my friends Pete and Kenzie were having a party and they saw I was a little bit despondent. I said, I can't really do healthcare anymore. I don't know what to do. I was sort of like that scene in The Godfather with Johnny Fontaine. What do you mean you don't know what to do? You know, they were like, you are, you need to do these tours. And I thought to myself, you know what? I love the creative aspect. I sort of always had a passion for like TV production, things like that. And I started to think, okay, if we had a really nice bus and, you know, a tour guide who was enthusiastic about where he's from, you know, and again, mind you, I'm thinking this in the third person, never realizing I'd be doing the tours, but thinking about what, what makes a great tour, what makes a really lousy tour. Um, and I thought maybe if we utilize those screens on the buses and use them to show the clips when we drive by or history that we're passing and showing them and slides and music. And suddenly this became, something I started to look into. I spoke to a friend of mine who worked at the Times Square uh, Visitor Center, and she said to me, your story is similar to someone else I know who started a successful company, Georgette Blau of On Location Tours. She said, you should speak to her. And Georgette was nice enough to meet with me and started, you know, over lunch, gave me this incredible information. She has been an invaluable mentor and to this day, close friend. Our families are close now. And she told me all the things I needed to know. I was like, wait, what do you mean I need a tour guide license? You know, what do you, what do you mean I need insurance? You know, it's telling me which bus companies to work with, who to align myself with, how to join NYC and company, all the things that you need to do yeah. to be a successful company, at least know how to run your company. She said to me, give yourself three months to do this. And I remember being upset because it took me four, but I completely immersed myself in it. And I hadn't had that kind of joy in a long time because I mean, there was a basic template of what I was doing, but suddenly the ability to be on a bus, be a little bit higher up off the ground, windows all around, the DVD presentation. And that's really where the the pizza tour began. And it was just that one tour, um, little by little, as people would ask me about other areas and I would develop other tours uh, and things like that. But that was the first one. And for some reason, it struck a chord with people. The editor, the travel editor of the Associated Press, I uh, lived in Brooklyn. Her name is Beth Harpaz, and she found out about it. And, you know, you send out emails and try to get some feedback. And she loved it because there was no tour of Brooklyn, and she really supported it. And she did three paragraphs that went out over the AP, I want to say a little more than a month before I actually launched. So you can imagine the groundwork that that, you know, that that laid down for me in terms of every small market around the country. So now people from Nebraska were hearing about this. People who were transplanted Brooklynites who moved to other places were hearing about it, people from overseas. And it just, it really took off. As I said, it struck a chord with people. I wanted to create the kind of experience where if you were going to come and take the tour, you know, this was a homegrown tour. You were taking a tour by a native Brooklynite. I didn't want this to be a boring tour. I wanted it to be where you were being escorted around with someone who was a friend or family and taking you behind the scenes. It was important to go to the pizzerias and not wait online to get in and have an arrangement with them. So you felt like a VIP and, and you saw these out of the way places and maybe some places that maybe seemed scary, but you were on the bus and it was safe and you saw where that film was shot, right? Because for some people, sure, they come for the pizza and some people come for the sightseeing and maybe people want to do Coney Island because it's a bucket list thing, but it never fails to bring me so much joy when you have that one guy on the bus who you think is having a good time. You're not sure because he's not showing it to you, but suddenly you've just recreated the French connection scene for him. And he is like a kid on Christmas morning because that's been his reference to Brooklyn the entire time. When I first started, people would say to me, Tony, I I don't mean to be insulting in any way, but this is not what I thought of Brooklyn. I thought Brooklyn was like projects and this like that. I said, look, this is what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to show you the good, the bad, and the ugly, all from the safety of the bus. And again, you have to remember, this was 2005 when I started. That's 14 years ago, before the big push that, you know, Brooklyn became this tourist attraction. You know, back in 2005, all you had were walking tours. It was important to me to get on a bus and go pick people up in Manhattan. We picked Union 
Union Square, why Union Square? People said, why aren't you uptown where all the tourists are? It, for me, it didn't make any sense. I had to get over to the bridge and over to Brooklyn as quickly yeah. as possible. Yeah. So you play around with different meeting locations. At one point, we tried the South Street Seaport. Fantastic on weekdays because you get to the Manhattan Bridge right away. You're there right out of the tunnel right away. Try on weekends, that area. It was, it was a ghost town. I mean, it might be different now, but the nearest train station isn't for quite a few blocks away. And then it gets very labyrinth-like as you get down to the seaport. Um, Union Square turned out to be perfect for that. And I have to say, you know, this morning I, I, I pitched up at Union Square. First of all, I was really surprised at the quality of the bus. I was expecting it to be to some, some small bus. Uh, the driver was friendly. And, you know, Paula, I mean, I, I know she's your cousin, but... So fortunate to have such a wonderful tour guide. Right from the off, she has an incredible talent of making everyone feel like they're part of a family. And I've been on hundreds and hundreds of tours. That's not always the case, right? Let's be honest. So right away, she was really good at breaking the ice. Within minutes, she knew where everyone was from. It's funny, you were talking about the article in the AP and everything else. On on the bus today, we had loads of Australians for mm-hmm. some reason. Mm-hmm. Um, myself being British, of course, you have people from Missouri, from Delaware, from Philadelphia. So there was a, a mix of people. And Paula right away, everyone chatting, made everyone feel at ease. Henry was a, is a really good driver. Yeah. Yeah. And, and well, to me, it's a really important that, you know, the bus is just a much a, a part of the component of the tour, an important part of the tour. And for me, years of taking tours and being on really just crappy buses, it's like the bus can make or break it, the tour guide. There are tour guides that are just, you know, showing up for the day and not yeah. really caring. And you could yeah. read that right away. Right. You know, one of the things that uh, is ingrained uh, both when I started and within my tour guides and they get it wholeheartedly is that we never ask for tips. We never pitch for tips because I just think that devalues the the experience that you've just had. You know, my feeling is you're spending your hard-earned money on coming and do a tour with us. If you really think that you had that great a day, you know, with Paula, that at the end of the day, you feel that she's, you know, really made the tour and you want to do something, that's fine. But, and, and they do well, my guides do really well because, you know, they're genuine. You could tell they're genuine. I appreciate your feedback on that. The bus has always been a bane of my existence. I had another meeting with a bus company today because we're always looking to maintain that quality. And with some bus companies, they'll give you their bus buses and drivers at first, and then they shift out to like the lousy drivers and the lousy buses. And it's a, it's a very uh, mutual relationship between guide and driver. You know, it's, you know, let's turn here, let's turn there. After a few times, now the guide, driver knows it. So there probably wasn't that much interaction between Paula and Henry at all because he knows it now. He knows when to slow down. And I tell people, you just see Paula, what you don't understand, you know, what's just as important is that driver that's slowing down for the clips, that's making sure he makes that light. So as Paul is speaking, he knows that she needs to show something. So do I get stuck on this side of the light or that side of the light and really planning it all out? As far as Paula, and I really appreciate your feedback, she is incredible. And, and we'll talk about all my guides in a moment. But what happened was in 2005, I started. And when the economy tanked, things got really, really bad. And I, I basically lost all the capital I had for this business. I was, it was like a, like a gambler and a disease. I was running half empty buses thinking, but they were full a few weeks ago. I know this can happen again. And you just run out of money. And that's why I tell people that enthusiasm and all that, that only goes a, a short way. The rest, these are things that come at you that, as I said, I just knew that I loved Brooklyn. I don't, you know, the running, the business, the, the pitfalls and all that you learn. And I certainly have learned. And I know they're not going to be the only pitfalls along the way, but hopefully, you know, they'll hurt less. But in 2007, one of the biggest blessings occurred when the Today Show, NBC's Today Show had me and the tour on. And we were just starting to get these little nuggets of, of press. And finally, they- So how did that come about? So the NBC Today Show- Tell, tell us what happened there. Well, it's a really interesting story. When I basically had lost all my capital and needed to go back to work in healthcare, and I really couldn't do it, but I realized I had to do it. And it's a classic story, which is probably sounds like fiction, but is totally true. I pulled into my parents' driveway in Brooklyn to have dinner, and my phone goes off. And uh, the guy on the other end says, hi, is this Tony Mui? I said, yeah. He goes, uh, hi, this is a photographer for the New York Times. I said, yeah, okay. And literally just before I turned off the engine, I had stopped in the driveway and just had this moment with the man upstairs that said, listen, it, you may need me to go back to healthcare, but I really can't do it. I feel like my, my real role in, in life is to do this. I'll go back, but please, you know, let's not make it 
the end. Let's make it where I can get back into doing the tour somehow. And I turn off the engine and this phone call comes in and I'm convinced. Now I'm going in to have dinner with my parents and my uncle Louie, who lives across the street. And my uncle Louie is a real comedian. And I'm convinced that the guy on the phone was put up to this by my uncle Louie. I'm thinking, did he hear me in the driveway? Maybe he was standing behind the car before he went in the house. I, I just didn't know. I was thinking so irrationally. The guy was getting frustrated with me. He said, look, I'm the photographer from the New York Times. I said, really? Okay. And what are you coming to take pictures for? When is the, when is the writer coming? And it was uh, Seth, I think Seth Camel, I think is his name from the New York Times. Right. And uh, he said he came already, but he didn't tell you. And I'm like, this sounds very fishy. They all tell me they're coming. He goes, look, he came already. I've been, and he's getting upset. And I'm thinking it's just a joke. So I said, for real? He goes, yeah, for real. So he ends up coming to take pictures of me on a tour. This article runs and they put my picture and they describe me as something, you know, lifted out of like a a Pulp Fiction novel of the 50s with tattoos and my hair slicked back and stuff like that. And that one piece did some incredible press for me and started to get some more bookings. So now it was starting to get better. And then I had a little radio piece on a local show called Food Talk that picked me up and then... The New York Times, I literally was driving. Things were not completely better yet, but I convinced to take my first vacation after two years. And that that vacation was going to be two days out, uh, all the way out on the Long Island where my friends were renting at Orient Point a house. And I was on the highway going out there and the phone rang. I said, I don't even know who it is. I'm not answering it. I put it down. I finally pulled over at a, like a rest stop and finally played the message. And the message was, hi, this is Meredith Reese, producer of the NBC's Today Show. I love the press you've been getting lately. Would it be okay if we did a segment with you? And I put the phone down. I just, it was crazy. I just, I let out a scream. And so this whole thing of going from like having lost everything and I'm kind of a very spiritual person. So that one conversation, you know, in the driveway and then boom, 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 the same things happen uh, to the point that the Today Show has me on in October of 2007. I just posted the video today on LinkedIn as a flashback Friday. And they estimated back then NBC's Today Show was the number one rated morning show. And they es- it aired at 845 in the morning. It lasted 13 minutes long. Before the segment ended, Zerve, my ticketing company, said that ticket sales were coming in and they continued to come in until midnight that night. Mostly women were home seeing it and thought this is, I mean, they're the planners, right? right. When you're on vacation yeah. and they were booking it for their husbands for the pizza and maybe the other stuff. And they wanted to see Brooklyn as well. And then they were bringing their families. And suddenly you go from like being absolutely broke to in one day, Zerve telling me that they had never seen record sales like that go from maybe about five, 10 to five to nine in the morning, literally until midnight, they were just coming in, coming in, coming in. And, you know, I mean, this isn't a groundbreaking statement, but I mean, to be on the top rated morning yeah, show, yeah, yeah. it's 8.45 in the morning. They estimated that 5 million people saw it and that really just took it to the next level. So now it's 2007. And now you go from having lost everything to suddenly getting a second chance. But Now you have to be careful what you wish for, right? Because now you're doing tours all the time, which isn't a bad thing, but you're exhausted. It just so happened that, you know, Paula had gone out to California, try her hand at acting and, you know, came back to help out, right, with the family business. It's funny we mentioned Uncle Louie because then I needed someone to help. And Uncle Louie, he's a great character. He's this, you know, classic Brooklynite, you know, charm a room full of people. Yeah. But, you know, a lot of times try, we tried putting him in front of a microphone in front of <laughs> 20-something people on the bus. And it's like Ralph Cramden from The Honeymooners, humana, humana, humana. You know, he just yeah. like he couldn't. But that was how it came about that Paula came on. And that was just a blessing because she got it. You know what I mean? If you're from Brooklyn and all my guides are, you know, Mark, Angela, all of them, it's important to me that they're from Brooklyn. I'll never forget taking a double decker tour bus of Brooklyn when it first started, when the double decker buses were doing it. And I wanted to see like, now you're coming to Brooklyn, like you weren't coming to Brooklyn before, but now you're coming. And that's something I've seen a lot of sort of the copycat Manhattan companies suddenly thinking they can make a buck and come to Brooklyn, but they don't really last because it's really more money making thing than it is something that they have in passion. Yeah, passion. Never miss an episode of the show. Subscribe at torpreneur.com forward slash subscribe. So before the NBC thing happens, right? Because one thing I'm trying to do on this show is, you know, if, when you read social media, everything's going well for everybody. Everything's flying. But unfortunately, that's not the reality when we're running 
any kind of business, right? right. There's peaks and troughs, right. and there are a lot of low points, especially when you're running a tour business, and especially 07, 08. How did you really get yourself through those low days? What did you What did you say to yourself? What did you do to to to, to you know to get through it? That's interesting. A, a lot of you know friends and family were there to be supportive. Yeah. I prayed a lot, yeah. <laughs> a lot. And because in the past I had always sort of cut and run in life, you know, unfortunately that's been my behavior. I realized that when I ran out of money and, you know, because the odds were against me at that point, right? Family was like, what do you mean you're leaving healthcare? You're leaving, you know, my parents were like, you you don't have health benefits. What are you doing? I mean, I went for so long without a salary, without benefits, without healthcare, whatever. So you, you just keep going because sometimes you say it's, it's the only thing I know how to do, you know, like even before my friends had convinced me to do it, there was that, you know, you sit down and, you know, these self-help books are like, you know, well, you know, you should sit down with a pad and write down what you know. And I was like, you know, I, I wrote down, you know, I know pizza, I know Brooklyn, you know, I know useless trivia that, you know, I seem to find interesting. And a lot of people do when I tell them about Brooklyn. So it it was kind of narrow there, but there was a passion about developing something that hadn't been done before. I don't know if there was another tour, if I would have been as enthusiastic if I wasn't the first one to do it, but there was this passion in me that I hadn't seen in a long time. So you try your best to push yourself, right? But you need to vent and you need to talk to people and maybe over a pint or six, you know, you speak to friends and they kind of give you some advice because I've come to learn that the more people you speak to, whether it's tourism or not, everybody's sort of fighting the same fight in some way, right? It's just a little bit different left or right. You know, now it seems like a blur when you ask me that question, how I got through it. But every time I got on that bus, there was a certain joy that came to me. Before every tour, I'd be so nervous. I'd even smoking back then. And my driver would say, why do you even smoke for? You know, it's like, you got this, you got this. But I'd be so nervous. And as soon as you get on and realize that, you know, this isn't another day in healthcare. You're not turning off another ventilator. You know, this is people who are here to have a great time. And then you're also learning because there's people on the bus from all over the world, right? So ironically, you you learn that people love your hometown by traveling. And then suddenly now here you are on the bus showing them around and everybody's coming because they want to know about it. So there were all these little nuggets that helped. You know, 14 years, you know, sort of becomes a blur after a while, but there were some lean times. And as far as getting through them, like I said, I mean, Friends help, family help. You really need to speak to people in the industry. To this day, we, it's not monthly, but we have an attractions meeting. And it's myself, Georgette from On Location Tours, Marla from Shop Gotham, and Brett Watson from Watson Adventures. And we meet. We try to do it once a month. It might not be once a month, but we get together every two months, three months. And literally, we realize that we're all going through the same things. We're like, hey, how are you handling this? Hey, you know what I just started doing? I just started doing Google my business. You guys should look into it. And suddenly you realize that, holy cow, you know, these people are there. And so I always, maybe I preach too much, but I try to tell people just surround yourself with your peers as much as possible because they'll help you. They've been through that. You're not the only one. No, I think that's a a lot of sound advice there about having your own mastermind group of people you can go to, especially people who, you know, they're not these empty suit gurus. I see a lot of this online, right? Oh, I help you build a seven figure business. And, you know, it's people who are in the trenches with you are the ones that are going to sustain you through those tough times. And I know you've mentioned Georgette. I'm really excited to talk to Georgette soon and find out more about her tours and how she's set up. But in what ways, because you've mentioned her as a mentor, in what ways has she been very helpful to your business? Well, like I said, if it wasn't for her, I don't know how I would have gone about it. It, it just, everything was perfect timing. When yeah. my friend Joni said, you know, you have to speak to Georgette because the stories are similar here. She left another occupation to start these these tours of Manhattan. She was everything. I mean, you know, to sit me down over lunch and give me all this advice and, you know, and because of that, to this day, if somebody's starting out, I make sure I sort of pay it forward if they yeah. need advice like yeah. that. And it's, I think it's important. And you know, every tour is different, whether it's a walking tour, a, a bus tour, but ultimately it's a tour, right? And there are certain elements of it that you need. And she was the one that really put me 
on the path of, you know, you need a tour guide license, you need insurance, you know, you should work with these bus companies. They could be really ruthless. You want nice buses. I go, absolutely. I want nice buses, you know, join NYC and company, you know, and then speak to this one and speak to that one. And she introduced me to Jennifer Ackerson, who has Elon marketing out on Long Island and, you know, working with Jennifer and Jennifer Pertil there was, you know, it was amazing because now they helped me and sort of groomed me for the trade shows, which are really important aspect. Who knew about trade shows in the beginning that I'd be doing, you know, trade shows and what a receptive operator is, you know what I mean? So, I mean, you could sit alone in your apartment and try to figure these things out, but I would imagine it's going to be real nerve wracking if you don't have any idea of what even the terms mean. Um, so these people were really invaluable. You know, I owe a lot to them because, you know, they were the ones that had the information I needed and, you know, you could listen or you could not listen. And I'm glad I listened, you know? Yeah. yeah. I'm sure listeners to the show right now are screaming out, when's he going to write a book? Ah, nah, get out of here. <laughs> well, because, you know, not everyone is lucky enough to have a Georgette. Right? Yeah. If, if I'm the other end of the country and I want to have my tour and you were lucky, you were done with Georgette and she mentored you. Now everyone has that mentor and I'm listening to you and I'm thinking, wow, is there a book like that out there? That's not, you know, not specific to New York City, but hey, here's, you know, four people who are involved in, in, in the industry and in the front lines, as it were. Here's how we did it. I, I mean, I think a lot of people would be interested. And we tried with that on the show, but mm-hmm. when we're chatting for an hour, yeah. you know, we can't get into everything. Yeah. But I think there's a real need for that. I think, well, like most, you know, books that do well, I think that, you know, if, if people can relate to it, obviously, and I think they do. And I think... Again, I think that with what you're doing with the Torpreneur podcast, I think really, really helpful because, you know, people can really find out what other people are going through. You know, there's certainly a lot of, now you see a lot of stuff online, how to be a better tour guide, right? And how to, you know, and I wondered if a learning annex class would have helped. The thing is, and, and, you know, I'm sure I'm going to get flack for this, is that when being a tour guide and having tours, you really have to maintain a certain level of quality. And I think that there was an era in the nineties when, because of all the cooking channels, everybody thought that they were going to become a chef, right? And all the cooking yeah. schools made millions of money on people that just said, Oh, I'm going to try that. And we weren't really good at it. You know, I think that, and I hope I don't come off sounding pompous when I say this, but if you're going to be a tour guide, like it has to be one of those things that you really have a passion about. Um, nobody wants to get on a bus or on a tour where the tour guide's just going through the motions. They feel it right away. And if that's not for you, like anything in life, if working in a cubicle is no longer for you, working in healthcare is no longer for you, then you need to get out because you're doing everyone a disservice, you know? So, uh, you know, it's one of those things where, um, I, I wondered sometimes, you know, if you did that and people suddenly went into it, cause it's like, Ooh, it's a, you make your own schedule and you do this. And you know, that's sometimes, you know, that has its, its pitfalls as well. A friend of mine that I grew up with teaches a business class in downtown Brooklyn. And and every semester he asked me to show up for the the chapter on, you know, owning your own business and S Corp versus L Corp and business plans and things like that and entrepreneurs. And he asked me to come in and speak to everyone. And, you know, you do like the pros and cons of owning your own business, right? And it's like, you know, whatever you put into it, you see the results. Consequently, whatever you put into it, you see the results. If you don't put into it, you know, it's like there's no one else to rely on. It's you. And I think that when you, I didn't even realize some of the things I'd be responsible for, you know, and healthcare was life and death. And I took that pager at the end of the day, the shift and gave it to that therapist. And I wasn't contacted again until I came in the next shift, you know. Now there's always someone, there's different time zones. You need a, a call center. If there's no call, there wasn't call centers in the beginning. So you're taking the calls and some ticketing agencies don't have call centers. And there's just so many different things that you can go through. I mean, I've changed ticketing companies. I can't tell you how many bus companies I've yeah. changed, you know, over the years. And, you know, it's never just, it never remains the same. You always have to, because you want to maintain that level of professionalism, but you're dealing with so many variables that are really going to screw that up for you. And that's the last thing you want. Yeah. So you started off with, with the pizza tour mm-hmm. and we call it pizza tour, but I have to say, having just been on right now, and I'm sure it, it's evolved. I've learned a ton today. I mean, I was, I was a bit of a nerd on the bus making some notes, but you know, the mafia stuff I learned about, but what I liked was it wasn't too heavy on no, the mafia stuff. There's no, a couple no, of stories, no, no, but yeah. it, it wasn't, you know, let's play up the stereotype. 
Although I did love it when we pulled up outside the house where Joe Pesci, when he thought he was going to get made <laughs> up and gets taken out. It took me forever to find that house. Oh, wow. Yeah, because none of us recognized forever. it. The guy next to me is like, I've watched that movie a hundred times. I didn't. I saw, those are photos of that for the, pop, the boys back home. That's awesome. That'll be on Facebook. So that was really good. I, and I absolutely loved you were talking about the clips, but, you know, I, I haven't watched Saturday Night Fever in probably 20 odd years, right? And then just watching that opening sequence. Yeah, and walk suddenly you're driving street. down the street where he's stru- strutting his stuff at the beginning. Yeah. One of the classic opening scenes in film history. So, you know, I can say that my point really is, yeah, it's it's kind of slice of Brooklyn pizza tour, but and the pizzas are great, of course, but there's so much more knowledge there. Well, the the thing was, you know, what do you do when you need to name your tour? And and you know, as far as you know, monkey wrenches, that was the very first monkey wrench I had before I even launched the tour. It was supposed to be three pizzerias, right? Three styles of pizza. One is the Neapolitan style you had today. Yeah. The second is what's known as a Roman style or a bar style. And there was a place in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, which we cover on the tour called Lentos, which was this very thin in Italian. They call it carta di musica, music paper, like parchment paper, thin. Uh, And then the third was Spumoni Gardens. Those were the three styles of pizza we had. And, um, Literally, the day we went to print our brochures and little things were happening as I went to Lento's pictures, old pictures were disappearing off the walls. It was a classic old bar, tiled yeah. floor, mosaic tile floor, mahogany wood bar and stuff, tables in the back. And little by little, things were disappearing. And the owner's son was telling me that, yeah, my aunt is opening in Staten Island, which I did know his father's sister. And she was taking some of the stuff there. And I wasn't too happy about it. It was starting to, to lose some of its you know, visual uh, quality. Anyway, we go to print the brochure, which was a trifold, each pizzeria getting their own section of the brochure. And I said, hey, we're, we're going to print today. I'll have, well, Tony, um, unfortunately, we're going to have to bow out. My father is uh, selling the business. So here you get this thing where you go, well, if there were three stops, could it be a pizza tour? And along the way, you're covering the neighborhoods you yeah. have to. So now if you picture it, yeah, you're going over the bridge and you're going to Dumbo, right? Yeah. You have Grimaldi's. Then you get on the highway, go deep into Bay Ridge, see the movie locations, but you're going to stop at another pizzeria. Then do some more sightseeing, Saturday Night Fever, Under the L, and you get you know the, the witness to the mob, and then you get to Spumoni Gardens. There was a flow to it, right? There was a flow that way. Well, what do you do when the pizzeria closes? They were friends of mine that said, you can't call it a pizza tour anymore. I go, what am I going to do? Yeah. What am I going to call it? Yeah. And there are some people, listen, there are other pizza tours now where you go to three, four different places and that's great, you know? But at the same instance, I think that, you know, if there are people that want to eat pizza all day and there are tours for that and for what we do, it turned out to be a blessing in disguise because now you were able to go to places and actually sit down. Imagine if you went to each place and only had one slice. Now you actually get to go in. Most places won't seat you for that. You know, you're certainly not going to get to skip the line for something like that. Now you sit down, everybody gets two slices. You really, I mean, imagine going to Grimaldi's having one slice and going, come on guys, we got to go to the next place. So that, and then, you know, I always say that we don't just feed your mind on I mean, your stomach on the tour. We feed your mind, your soul. You said we're showing you really I'm completely immersing you in this borough. So when you realize that there was a third pizzeria involved, the flow makes much more sense. But what was I going to do? I would put all I, you know, all my chips were in. That was it. And so you continue, you rearrange your brochure. And to this day, people go, oh, it wasn't really a pizza tour. So how can they call it a pizza tour with only two places? But if you look at the description and then suddenly you say to yourself, well, there aren't enough pizza places. You'll move on. But then if you look at the description, you'll see, oh, wow, Saturday Night Fever. We're going to go to Coney Island. We're going to take pictures. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. And the other thing and learn a lot. You know, when I first started, I would go to the Brooklyn Borough President's meetings on tourism. And it would basically be me and a lot of older tour guides who are really upset because I was getting some press. And they were upset that their five-hour tour of the Battle of Brooklyn wasn't doing well. And I'm thinking, well, how much more can you paint yourself into a corner? My whole thing was, if you get on that bus, we'll give you a little of everything. So chances are something's going to strike a chord with you, right? Otherwise, you'll just enjoy the variety of what we're throwing at you. You know, there's not a lot of the mafia stuff, but there's a time and a place where it applies during the tour. You know, you'll get one style of peach, you'll get another. What also has served us really well and has been a, a complete blessing in disguise is the fact that with these two places, you know, we work with tour operators who bring their own buses, their own groups with their own buses, right? So we do discounted group pricing. So now you're talking about 45 to 50 people on a bus that we still do the same tour you did today. 
You know, our public tours may have 23 people, 20 like today, 38, and we use different size buses accordingly. But suddenly it turned out to be a blessing with only two because now you've got 50 people to shuttle around and each restaurant can actually accommodate them. We get restaurants all the time still emailing me, hi, this is Joe from so-and-so's pizza. We'd love to work with you. What's your seating capacity, Joe? And that's part of the charm, too. If you're going to come to Brooklyn and you're going to come to the, especially by the time you get to LMB, I mean, Spawnee Gardens, that's as deep into Brooklyn as you can get without knowing where you're going. And then still you completely go right to your tables. There's a certain, to me, there's a certain charm in that. It's a, it's, that's necessary for what we do. Especially at Grimaldi's today, because we got there, what, 11 o'clock, well, it's 1130 or whatever. And there's a line outside already. Yeah. And you go straight in. I yeah. know Paula said, if anyone says anything to you, do not say anything back. Because people are, you know. How yeah, we tell, them, we tell them to say forget about it. Hey, forget you know? about it. What does that mean, forget about forget it? Forget about it. Oh, forget about it is like the Brooklyn Aloha. You know, if something's good, like, oh, man, this cup of coffee, forget about it. Or, if, you know, some guy's like a scumbag, like, you see that guy over there? Forget about it. You know? <laughs> you <laughs> I know love it. I, mean? I yeah. love it. I you love know, it. You know, something's like... You know, it's like there's a scene in, um, we used to use it as the intro to the tour to give people sort of an orientation. And it's the scene from uh, Donnie Brasco. Yeah. You know, yeah. he's like, just forget about it. You know, like Mingya, those peppers, forget about it. You know, if a girl is a beautiful girl, oh, forget about it. But if a guy's a piece of garbage, like, she had jerk off over there, forget about it. You know? Like, and I, like, just, I just love it. And I love that that's your company logo. And, yeah. You know, Manhattan, forget great. about it. Forget yeah. about it. You know, I love Manhattan. I have friends in Manhattan. I mean, you know, our tour starts from Manhattan. But how do we convey in the best Brooklyn sense what we're trying to do? And Manhattan, forget about it. It was just, yeah. what it just, it clicked and I had it copyrighted. So now it's, uh, it's our official slogan. I think that really just puts it into perspective. There's a lot to do in Manhattan, but the goal was to show people that like, look, we're going to get you over to Brooklyn in about 15 minutes. Wait till you see what waits for you, you know? In other words, we've always tried to do a Coney Island tour. I felt that Coney Island really needed a boost. Yeah. For many years it did, and it could still use a dedicated tour. My idea was to involve the businesses there, the aquarium, Nathan's, et cetera. You know, the problem is how do you start in Manhattan? Imagine after taking the tour today, what if the destination was Coney Island? How would you go from Manhattan and get everybody to Coney Island in a direct, and you can't always do highway. You got to get off and do the streets. But the way we do it, People come on a tour and that's a bucket list thing for many people. You touched on something earlier that I I wanted to go back to, which was, you know, we started with the pizza tour and what happened was the pizza tour did really well from August until November of 2005. And then that's when I got my first hit around November, December, it went dead. And I called Georgette up. I said, Georgette, are you having problems? Like I don't have any sales. She goes, oh, you know, I forgot to tell you, everything becomes Christmas centric here in the city. And, you know, it becomes like the slope here. I go, well, how long does it last? You know, and I had this book, which I still have to this day, which I used at my first meeting with Georgette and all notes until I filled it up and it's falling apart now. But I made a list of the tours I wanted to do. And there were different tours in different areas. And I grew up in an area not far. I have family in an area where they and friends that they do the Christmas lights of Diker Heights, which is legendary now. Right. But Christmas was one of my favorite holidays. And when I saw December was dead that first year, I said, wait a minute, I've been completely caught off guard here. Here I am, sort of life gives you lemons. This is one of the tours I had an idea for. So I said, this won't happen again. I'll be ready the following year. So the following year, we kind of put this tour together. And that really, you know, I mean, I I wish it could be December year round. We literally run like three or four sold out 56 buses at night, 56 passenger buses. And it's become quite, quite a phenomenon. So that was the second one I developed. To connect with other tourpreneurs, then join our Facebook group at tourpreneur.com forward slash Facebook. How did you get the word out about that the first year? Back then we were with Zerve. So you, if you have people's email addresses, you can stay in touch and do some email marketing, right? That's really important to stay in touch. Now it seems like it's the norm, but back in the day, it was sort of like, you know, you're figuring this out as you go along kind of a thing. And that's become invaluable to have, you know, uh, an email list of, of people that you, you email, you notify, you notify. And, and, and Christmas in New York city seems to be its own phenomenon. We can get people that come back to visit us because they had such a great time on the pizza tour. They're like, I'm going to come back. I'd love to do another tour with this company, you know? 
There's other people that come here only at Christmas time, no other time, Shane. And so suddenly there was an activity and we tell people, go see the tree, maybe even have dinner if you want. We literally have five, six, seven and eight o'clock departures from Union Square. And but back then it was only one a night. But what I'm saying is that Christmas is huge, yes. right? Yes. If you're going to be in a city where Christmas is huge, this is the city to be in. And again, that just struck a chord with people and they came and the, the lights were making a name for themselves. But as I was doing the tours, suddenly we were getting on, you know, Good Morning America. And, and last year, last year, just last year, we did Good, Good Morning Britain, a live feed, but we would do, you know, RAI and, and Italy and, and, you know, German television would come. And Brilliant. In, in fact, in fact, it almost seemed like but, the Europeans knew more about it than the Americans. So you almost make it sound really easy, but these guys just didn't just call you up. No. Right? You must have done some PR work to get on their radar. I think... You know, again, the subject matter and the things that we were dealing with and in a city like this, um, but it was easier then than it is now in terms of to make a name for yourself. Like nowadays, you know, if you were to, and I've had it, I don't want to say had it out, but I've, I've met journalists at IPW that said to me, oh, I just did a story on Brooklyn. I'll be pitching Brooklyn to them. I did, yeah, where? Oh, Williamsburg. And I'll be like, you know, and depending on my, you know, when you catch me and if I've had enough coffee or not, I remember one in particular, I forget his name, but he's a very well-known travel journalist. He's Australian. And uh, I said to him, well, when you're ready to cover the real Brooklyn, let me know. <laughs> my whole thing was, you know, now, now it's sort of waning a little bit, but there was a period where Brooklyn was conveniently Williamsburg for everybody. Right. That's what Brooklyn was. And I was like, listen, and they were like, do you do Williamsburg? And we, we don't cover Williamsburg. We can't cover Williamsburg because a lot of the streets aren't wide enough for buses and stuff like that. They're mostly walking tours. But I tell people we cover everything from, from the Manhattan Bridge down to Coney Island. We go from the East River down to the Atlantic Ocean yeah. and everything in between, right? Yeah. But the Christmas tour was the second one. And that one, I wish it was December all year long because that's really, uh, you know, really been an, an incredible experience. And were you the only tour or are you the only tour that was doing that? When I, start, when I started, yeah. I was the only company doing it. Uh, now, a lot of Manhattan companies, companies who have literally told me they stole my tour yeah. route from drivers who had worked for me and stuff like that. But luckily, they they don't cover everything because as Brooklynites, we know still the out of the way places. So we cover houses that they'll never know where they are. And that sets us apart. But that, that gets annoying because they don't do anything the rest of the year, right? Uh, as far as Brooklyn, they don't promote Brooklyn in any way. There's no money coming back to the businesses, right? Yeah. To the local economy like we do. But I digress. Then what we call the neighborhood tour then is now the best of Brooklyn tour, yeah. much better name, of course. But there were other areas of Brooklyn that I'd be on the pizza tour and they'd say, hey, are we going to Park Slope? Are we going to, you know, Greenwood Cemetery? What about, you know, you know, juniors? And I thought, you know what, we can develop an entirely different tour and hopefully one day you come back and take it. But it's completely different areas of Brooklyn, you know, where you go to Brooklyn Heights and there's other movie locations like The Godfather and Moonstruck and As Good As It Gets and things like that. So that's how that tour came about. And then the chocolate tour, which is the most recent tour, came about because, you know, my wife is convinced I love to start tours based on foods I love and I am an <laughs> absolute chocoholic. And since 2000, you know, this has been this incredible chocolate revolution in Brooklyn, starting with Jacques Torres, you know, and so he's our first stop on the tour. And we have places like the Chocolate Room and Lilac and Rock, and each one does something different from the classic to the artisanal to the really sort of creative to the, uh, you know, off the wall sort of flavor combinations. And that turned out to be, you know, another great tour. Um, and now we're working on a, a brewery and distillery tour I because did, that's another, yeah. that's another thing I love is beer. Yeah. So it, that's become a little bit more of a challenge in terms of getting the places because a lot of them aren't open and except for maybe Thursday, Friday evenings and Saturday, Sunday. Right. And we naturally, we run our tours during the week. So that was another thing with my guides having a conversation saying, I don't think you guys want to work on evenings, do you? And they both said to me, Mark and Paul have said, we're willing to do it for six months if we can get it going. And then we just hire guides. They want to, and that's important. You know, when you have the breweries, they all have different hours and stuff like that. So that's been the challenge. It hasn't been like, you know, Grimaldi's or Spumoni Gardens, which is open every day except holidays. You know what I mean? Or juniors on the Best of Brooklyn tour. As far as the tour guides, one of the, it's really important. I think that you, obviously, you have to treat your tour guides with respect, but there's this whole thing that Gary V is doing lately, which is about your employees and about, you know, how, you know, people say, you know, 
they don't have, you know, the same enthusiasm that I have. And they're not going to have the same enthusiasm you have. You are the owner of the company, but sort of what are you doing for them? What kind of environment are you building for them? From the very beginning, you know, I gave the guide scripts and I said, this is what I do. In fact, when Paula came on, she's like, I need a script. And I go, what script? It was all in my head. Yeah. And everything outside the bus was the visual cue. And I guess much like somebody who's in a play, I guess, you know, as the bus rolls along, that's how you figure out what to say, the visual cues. But Paula wanted a, a script. And there I was sitting down at a computer and I type with two fingers. It came out to 20 pages. So now you hand the script over to your guide, right? But I was like, you know, do this in your voice. This is what I say. The facts are the facts. You can't change the facts. You yeah. can't change the numbers. You can't change the dates. Yeah. But, and then she's- Unless you're Uncle Lou. <laughs> and then, and then, right, right. And then, but, but, you know, that was another thing too. When I first started, there was a big article about how these double decker buses in the city were giving the wrong information out. And, you know, I'll never forget somebody who was part of the, I forget what tourism organization. I don't know. It was like one of the bus companies, actually, one of the heads of the bus company said something stupid, like, well, you know, people don't want facts. They just want to be entertained. And I was like, why nah. would you even say something like that? You idiot. So for me, it was important that they have the dates, they have the facts Correct. But like someone like Paula, you know, she'll show you where her grandmother lived or yes. she might tell you which house she may want to live in is a dream yeah. to live she in. She went to school. We yeah. saw it all. That yeah. was great. Yeah. When I first started, I started to veer away from those stories. To me, it was almost like copping out because it wasn't about me. It was about the borough. And I had many people, friends and people who took the tour that would come up to me or write to me afterwards and say, put more stories in of yourself. I'm like, it's not about me, but that's what helps people connect. I don't know about your hometown, but if you suddenly say to me like, oh, you know, this is where me and my mates used to, well, yeah, I have mates back home. We used to hang out at whatever yeah. it was, you know? So that's important. Same thing with Mark. When he got the script, I wanted him to, and he, he gives something completely different to it as well. I also make sure I pay my guides really well. People think it's crazy what I pay my guides, but you know, there's a, there's a point that you have to make it, you know, they, they work part-time sometimes, sometimes there's a lot of great work, but without them, you know, I would be on there doing every single bus and probably every tour and I'd be dead, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's important, you know, and, and in terms of giving them that autonomy, when they first started, they were shocked that I wasn't going on the bus and critiquing them but the reviews were coming in and they were all five-star reviews, Shane. I mean, and I was blessed. Now, had they not been five-star reviews, I probably would have jumped in. But my employer skills, you know, leave a lot to be desired. Why? Because I can create the experience, but I've learned over the years, I can't wear all the hats. If, if anything, I've actually done a disservice to myself and, and done damage to myself by thinking I could wear, or to the business rather, by thinking that I could wear all the hats. But I said to them, I go, do you really want me on the bus staring you down? Well, they're like, no, no, maybe not, yeah, yeah. maybe not. But the reviews always came in. Now, are there lousy reviews that come in? Absolutely. And it used to kill me in that first year when they would come in because they would be unfounded. It would be somebody, you know how it is, right? This You can't make everyone happy. But in the beginning, those reviews mean so much to you, right? Now when they come in, now I laugh it off. I wish the Tony of 14 years ago had taken the advice of people from Zerb who wouldn't remove the review and said, Tony, don't you understand those lousy reviews? They make no sense and help the other reviews seem even better. So now they get sandwiched in and, you know, somebody will f focus on one thing, you know, a review will come in like pizza was good, but the tour was too long. That's what you got out of four and a half hours. That's what you got out of it. <laughs> Crazy. You know, I'm giving it one star. Okay. All right. Great. I mean, Paula today, talking about reviews, she mentioned at the end of the tour, hey, you could get an email. We, yeah. we love reviews. It's totally optional. And she actually said, be honest. But my mother does print out every review I mentioned. <laughs> Which is a great line, right? right? I mean, a great right, line. Right. But there was no pressure. No. And like you say, there was no, oh, you know, we survive off tips and blah. Didn't no, mention no, tips no, at no, all. No, 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 not and, at all. Um, not at all. No. We didn't realize that people were talking about us on TripAdvisor. This was many years ago. This isn't the TripAdvisor we're talking about now, right? But when TripAdvisor was starting out, we would ask people, because you see, there's that downtime on the bus. You ask people where they're from. Yeah. You, you converse with them. How did you hear about us, right? The Today Show, or we were on Australia's Getaway because we had sent someone to do a trade show for us, and we managed to score that clip. But a lot of people said, oh, they're talking about you on TripAdvisor. We're like, they are? And back then, Zerve wouldn't give us the emails of the people booking. They felt wow. it was private. It was a completely wow. different yeah. playing field back then. Uh, things are different now. And so what we do is 
we realized this is downtime that we have to speak to people, maybe do a little promo without it being pushy. And what we do is, you know, we pass around that clipboard because now we realize, you know, these reviews and what trip, the power that TripAdvisor has, again, Yelp never had that power because they just made a bad name for themselves. But TripAdvisor was the be all end all. Once we realized that we would ask people. And so, so you kind of learn, you know, you, you put these pieces together, like would people appreciate getting a discount for the next time they come back? Why not? How do you get that discount to them? How do you get reviews? So the idea was in that downtime, and not everybody has that downtime if you're walking tour, but if you have access, you know, we say to people, if you'd like to join our mailing list, we'll let you know when those next tours are up and running. We do promotional discounts. We do giveaways, anniversary uh, giveaways and things like that. But we'll let you know when the next tour is up. You can unsubscribe anytime. We send out one monthly newsletter. That's it. And there were months before, you know, now I have someone helping me, but there were months where I was completely missing months because as someone with OCD and, you know, control freak, you try to get these things to be as perfect as they can. And it's debilitating, literally. I mean, that's another thing that is worthwhile in exploring. You know, those of us who own companies that have OCD and are control freaks and like talk about being your own worst enemy. But you know that when something's perfect, it's perfect and you put it out the way you want it. So we realized that if we use this downtime to sort of, entice and nicely ask people to give us an email address and say, you can unsubscribe anytime you want, get that discount if you want. But some of them unsubscribe, but some of them stay on. And now they get that monthly newsletter and we're able to communicate with them what we're doing. There are people that after maybe a year or two realize I'm never coming. And they'll, they'll actually be nice enough to fill it out when they opt out and say, I don't think I'll be coming to the States anymore. Maybe they're getting older, whatever it is, but people stay on. And then we just sent one out recently regarding the 4th of July and that the fireworks are going to be in Brooklyn. So it doesn't always have to be about us, but it has to be everything is Brooklyn, our blog is on there so they can read about Brooklyn as well and give them some kind of value for them, you know, instead of always being pushing, pushing, pushing the business. But people wrote back, how are you guys? We miss you guys. We hope to come back. And so now you have this interaction with folks and because it doesn't really end when the tour is over, you know, what you just had on that bus conveys the next time you come in between, whatever. So that turned out to be really something invaluable for us. Again, now people are doing it. And if they're not, I hope they're doing it. But that became invaluable for us to have that clipboard where they willingly, because that's the thing. You know, people have to willingly want to get an email. You can't just throw stuff their way. Unfortunately, now, you know, there's post-tour emails that thank them and would you like to do this and would you like to review or whatever. But that became crucial for us because we were able to, uh, you know, find out who willingly wanted an email, send them information, put them in our database, do email marketing. So by in that email, email that they get, this is what I was trying to get at. It says to them, you know, if you had a great time and, you know, we have a Facebook page, if you want to stay in touch, post some pictures from your tour, yeah. would you take a quick moment to post a review? And we give them a choice that could be Google, could be Yelp, could be TripAdvisor, whatever they use. And we had suddenly went from like, you know, 23 reviews on TripAdvisor where people were talking about us to this incredible amount. And, yeah. you know, again, for some people, I'm sure that's old news, but that really, really helped us out. Yeah. As far as the OTAs, it's getting a little bit crazy with the OTAs. I think that they're becoming more and more demanding. Um, they're being more constricting. They're strangling us. If that wasn't bad enough for the 20% that they take, you would think, okay, well, you're getting the business honestly and getting, you know, doing marketing and stuff like that. But what they're doing is they're stealing your Google AdWords. And it's not uncommon to go into Google and type a slice of Brooklyn bus tours word for word and for, you know, two or three ads to appear, one for TripAdvisor Viator, one for Expedia. One even popped up for Get Your Guide, which we don't even work for anymore. We don't even work with anymore, but they linked it to their page of Brooklyn Tours because now there's Brooklyn Tours. When I started, there were no Brooklyn Tours, maybe a few walking tours, but now they can, you know, they're doing their own tours as well, you know, hiring their own local guides. So they're they're getting very cutthroat and I'm concerned about what's going to happen you know, with TripAdvisor and they bought up Viator and I speak to people at Viator, they're very unhappy because their roles have changed dramatically. They don't have a say in things. There isn't that, you know, OTA tour operator relationship that there was, you know? So it's changed things a lot. And the thing is, it's like everything is peaks and valleys, isn't it? In this industry, you know what I mean? Now, you know, there's things that are, the things are changing the face of tourism. I speak to people who, you know, see, everybody sees the difference now. People come and, you know, the dollar might be different and people are doing the leisure passes, right? So you have to rethink what you're doing to create activities that cost less maybe and are shorter, 
right? I don't know. But again, it's a constant changing playing field. And without the OTAs and the stunts they're pulling that I'm a little bit concerned about where it's going to go from here. Can you survive without working with them? We are seriously thinking right now of getting rid of them because, you know, the, the challenge is this. You really need to hire a good SEO company, right, to help you. So they optimize your website and do Google AdWords for you. How does a small company, I mean, my budget keeps going up more and more because I have to fight with these Goliaths who have much more money and have entire teams of people in front of the computers all day. And then you throw in something like API where they have direct access and you say, Am I really sleeping with the enemy here? What's going on? Like, how do I know they're not playing me up so on the days they need to sell, that's when they send traffic to me or whatever? But the fact that they're stealing you, you know, the Google AdWords and buying those up and stuff, and and then suddenly I can't spend the same amount of money for the same thing, it becomes a little bit crazy. And I just don't know, you know, how ruthless they'll get. My whole thing is I would love to not work with them. And there was a period where I started getting rid of, rid of them all. I started with the receptive operators because everybody wanted 30%, but nobody was bringing you the business at 30% warranted. Now these guys have the nerve to take 30% if you let them, right? Because they play you for a fool sometimes, allow them to take 30% and they'll still screw you over by going in backwards with the Google AdWords and all that. That's how I got rid of Viator originally, Yeah, you know, because I didn't like the way they were playing dirty. And we got rid of a bunch of them because what was the point of doing all this manpower and getting them into the system for, you know, 20%, 25, 30%, and the volume's not coming. Expedia just sent us an email now that as of August 1st, everyone has to be switched over to 24 hour cancellation because that helps sell better. People love seeing that. Well, let me tell you something. We've had a lot of tours and I'm not pointing any demographic out in particular. We had a lot of tours where maybe one or two of their mates didn't show up because they were wasted and the ones that did show up were hung over and stuff. How about a 24-hour cancellation there? How quickly would they have canceled on us? I can't afford that. As it is, we have our own policy, which is no refunds or cancellations once tickets are purchased. That's a widely used general you know, policy. But they require 72 hours, the OTAs. I'll do 72 hours. I'll meet you halfway. Show me you'll bring me the business. Now, Expedia sends this email, and I was like, absolutely not. We'll stick with 72 But even that I'd rather not do, but I'll stick with 72, but you'll never get 24 hours from me. I said, and you're certainly not warranting it by the sales I'm seeing because your sales have been declining year by year. And we went from 25 with them to 20%. And people need to keep that in mind. These, these, These companies are not the be all end all. They can ask what they want, but they don't generate the kind of revenue that you know, they want for that percentage. And we went to Expedia and said, your sales have been, you know, in the beginning, Viator came, right? And Viator kicked everyone's butt, yeah, right? And yeah. they, they put Expedia in the dust, right? They left them in the dust. Expedia didn't know what to do. And their sales pretty much disappeared. They had to revamp and reorganize and whatever. Well, now you come back and you want 25% and your sales are going down year by year. And I'm like, no, that's crazy. I'm not giving you. So the policy at our company is that we're not doing more than 20% with anyone. Some people ask for 10, some people ask for 15. But again, if they come in the beginning, I used to give everybody what they wanted. And then it was like, you know, Georgette and other people would be like, are they sending you the revenue? Are they warranting that? So I got rid of all the receptives in the beginning, 30% to just show up at trade shows and schmooze with you and wonder why you don't sell me. And one of the worst things that ever happened too was that one of the companies was working with a receptive company, receptive operator, and I spoke to them and said, how come you guys aren't sending me any business? And they said, oh, Tony, you need to have a German tour guide. I said, well, why didn't you tell me this? For three years, I've been seeing your trade shows, giving you 30%. I go, okay, I'll look for a tour guide unless you have some. Oh, we have someone. We have someone, Gunther. We, he is, he's a German. He lives here in, in New York. We we'll give you Gunther. And Gunther comes on the tour and he takes a tour with me and everything's great. And then I don't hear anything else because as a one-man business, you have other things yeah. to do. And I didn't follow up with it. And all of a sudden, they start doing a Brooklyn tour. And they start showing up the same spots that we went to. And when I called up, I spoke to, I don't remember who it was. I said, I don't hear from you guys for six months to a year. And now you come out with your own Brooklyn tour and Gunther's doing it. And she said, I'm going to really just set me off. She's like, well, maybe we're your competition now, Tony. And I'm like, really? I said, okay. 
I said, let me speak to so-and-so. And I spoke to so-and-so who was my contact person. I said, what the F is going on? How dare you? And that's a thing. Like people are cutthroat, you know, so you get leery as to, because people say, well, you're not doing enough foreign uh, language tours. And I'm like, I can't take that chance. I've been screwed already. You yeah. know what I mean? Like that was one of the worst things that ever happened. But here is a company just to show you, like they took 30% for three years, didn't send me hardly anything. Then tell me I need a German tour guide. And then that German tour guide comes, recreates the entire tour. And they even have the nerve to show up to L&B Spumoni Gardens and sit outside. Now, where I come from, that warrants a baseball bat to the head. But my wife goes, no, Tony, you're a businessman now. You can't act like that <laughs> anymore, right? Right? Yeah, yeah. But where I come from, yeah. there's payback for that. Yeah. So, you know, you have to go from being, all right, now I have to be the, the smart business guy instead of the guy that has that gut reaction of what I want to do to them. So anyway, I don't know where I'm going with that, but that was one of the things that was really just when you talk about challenges that you can have as a company. So how did you deal with it though? So, you know, they've copied your tour, they're out on the streets. What did you do? You just have to be better at at what you are. And then I give my wife credit for this as a way of calming me down because she knows the maniac that I am. But, you know, this stuff doesn't fly with me. And, And when people were starting to copy and starting to do these tours, she'd say to me, why do you, why are you looking back? Why aren't you looking forward? You have, you know, X amount of years of experience. You can't buy that. They, you know, they can't get that. Maybe they'll steal your crumbs. And when you start looking at it like, oh, they're stealing my crumbs. Now, if they start putting a dent in your business, that's a complete other thing. We have this Christmas lights tour of Brooklyn and the company I mentioned earlier that copied our tour and their guides literally said to my face that they copied the tour from one of our ex drivers or whatever. They do a lot of business. Now, knock on wood, we do four buses a night. They still can't touch us. Does it still kill me to see them there? Absolutely. Do I still want to do physical harm to them? Absolutely. Will I go to jail? Absolutely. But if you look at it like, and now it doesn't bother me as much anymore because, you know, ultimately if you're successful, that's the best revenge. So they can try and copy you, right? But if you keep doing what you're doing, I met with a tour operator in the Netherlands, uh, New York.nl is the company. His name is Eric and he used to live in New York and then he moved to Europe and he's incredible. He has New York.nl, New York.it, New York.de. Right. And he came in and we had a meeting. He was in, we had lunch. We were talking about a lot of the things he's seen a drop to with these, with these passes and stuff. But he said to me something that was really very flattering. He came in at Christmas time. And because he, his thing is he needs to sell, he does work with the competitors because they have an earlier tour. And he's begged me to do an earlier tour because he'd rather send them on our tour than that one because he knows ours is the better product. But he said, what you guys do, he goes, I haven't seen. Like the the guides are on the bus. They bring 56 people into the neighborhood. We put stickers on them so we don't lose them in the crowds. When they get there, myself and my wife are greeting the people as they get off the bus and then escorting that group of 55 and stationing ourselves at corners. So when they come around, I mean, imagine dumping a a group of 55 people in Times Square. I mean, that's the equivalent of the Brooklyn version. So it, it was very flattering to you. And that's what you do. He says, what you guys do? He goes, Tony, he goes, what you guys do? He goes, nobody does that. He goes, I was floored by the, the personal touch. And, you know, at the end of the tour, everybody gets a magnet to take home. We don't even play that stuff up. You know what I mean? But, but it's important that you know that you came and you had this incredible experience. Now, unfortunately, there are going to be companies that are playing games with Google AdWords and they're going to get that. But there are a lot of people that when they come and they see how we organize our groups and they're on some, you know, tour company that just doesn't have it right. And the tour guide's not with them and not telling them the stories of the homeowners. We grew up with these homeowners. We know their stories. So you want to just make money and come in, bring people in like cattle and dump them off. Then yeah, it pains me to see people waste their money on a company like that. Did you know every weekday Shane curates the most interesting news articles in tours and activities and sends them out in a snappy daily digest. Grab your copy of the Tourpreneur Daily Briefing at www.tourpreneur.com. I've got two last things before we wrap up. So Fair Harbor, how long have you been working with Fair Harbor? So what happened was when Zerv collapsed, everybody was talking to Fair Harbor. At the same time, I was honestly sort of being wooed by companies like ResD. Peak. Uh, Peak. Well, uh, Peak never really, they wanted right. us and then never really followed up. Now I, I get calls all the time by them. And people said, we love Fair Harbor. Why don't you go with Fair Harbor? And that's when we went over uh, to Fair Harbor. And so we've been with them for about, I want to say two, three years. Um, you know, there's always new companies coming around and, you know, calling us and wanting our business. And, 
you know, sort of talking our language and what's our language, you know, like, you know, everybody says we can help you with more sales, but once you join, they're not exactly doing the SEO you need. And maybe, maybe you have a website that's not that great. So now you need the website. So you try to work with them and have them develop the website and they have no clue because they're using a template and suddenly they can't go around that template. Yeah. We just went through this with Fair Harbor. Yeah. I have an SEO guy who does my website and SEO and we were promised we would have the back end. So what they couldn't do on their end because of the template, the team would do it. The people that do coding and all that. Suddenly we had no access to the website. I'm like, you know, spacing issues. I'm like, you realize who you're talking to? I'm like OCD. You know, I'm like a control freak. I don't want to see any spacing issues. This is what we need. Title sizes, et cetera. Oh, well, no, we won't be able to do that. And, and that really left a bad taste in my mouth. So if you had asked me this question about 14 years ago or 10 years ago, whatever it was, I would have told you, you know, we're going to write off into the sunset with Zerf. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But since then, there have been companies that have wanted our business and didn't understand the fact that you need a call center. Even now with Fair Harbor, the call center they have, they put us with one in the United States that really was dropping the ball continuously. And now we're with a, in the Philippines. Right. But now we're talking to another company and they actually have a call center in Louisiana. Right. So you start to say to yourself, what's good enough? And at one point, do you put your foot down and say, OK, it's time for transition again. And I used to really, really just make myself sick over the changes and the transition because they weren't my decisions. You know what I mean? Somebody was was doing something that caused me to have to make them. Now I look at it like, OK, maybe this is fine for now, but how is it going to work you know, for us, because that's what it needs to, because you can't put your faith in OTAs, you can't put your faith in ticketing companies, you can't put your faith in, you know, who does your website, you know, what I mean, you can hope that they all do it right, you're certainly paying good money for it, right? But, you know, I constantly see that as a challenge. I just had a company, a meeting with another bus company today because, you know, the bus company that we started going with, again, the whole bait and switch, good buses, good drivers, and suddenly now they're lousy drivers, lousy buses, equipment issues. How dependent are we on equipment on our yeah, tours? yeah, yeah. yeah. You know? Now you show up without a remote, you show up with a DVD player that doesn't yeah. work. How are you going to do one of our tours without a DVD player? You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So there's absolutely. always challenges. They never stop. Sure. And then social media, I want to commend you on your social media because that's how I first got to find out about you guys. And it was through, I think, LinkedIn. I always see oh, you guys posting you. fun stuff on LinkedIn. And it's fun stuff. It's not boring corporate oh, stuff. thanks. It's always, hey, you know, here's John Smith from Colorado. He yeah. grew up in Brooklyn. He's enjoyed his tour. Yeah. You know, it's very engaging social media. Yeah, I think that, um, and this is another thing I learned from following Gary V, which is, you know, you can sell, sell, sell all, all you want. And there is a certain healthy, you know, he, he has this whole thing of, you know, jab, jab, jab. Yeah. You know. But ultimately, you know, and it took me a lot to understand because you're, you're spending money on someone to do your social media. And then you find out there's conversations taking place, but the relationships that we have with those people and what we introduce them to and, and, and all our Facebook posts, you know, aren't always about our tours. They're Brooklyn related. And then you have people that find out about that. Oh, I grew up in Brooklyn. Maybe I'll come back and do a tour. And my SEO guy says he's never seen the kind of results that we're getting. And I have Allison, her company is organic content and she does my SEO and she's phenomenal. Right. And she does Facebook, Twitter. I told her to ease off on Pinterest for now, but Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Yeah. Right. Yeah. She does my blog as well. LinkedIn, I do because right. it doesn't take too much. And, you know, out of my day and, and Google. But what was happening was in order to have those relationships, it's possible for me to be on the computer all day long. And I, I need to do stuff to run the company. So I appreciate you saying that because it took me a long time to realize that, too. But you need to engage people in a way that there has to be something that's of value to them. Yeah. You know, every once in a while, you can let them know about the tour. When we post something tour related, people will be like, oh, I had a great time with Mark. You know, he made my tour that day. Paula was fantastic. And it could be a review. Could it be a picture that Paula or Mark took on the tour? Yeah. Sometimes they send us pictures. The other thing we do, which is, uh, I think, you know, a value is that every every Tuesday we do a giveaway on Facebook, you know, whether it's a hat or a shirt. Um, but to me, it's like, you know, we can certainly sell, 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 sell. And in the beginning, even I was like, gosh, you know, I'm a small business. It's like you know, I'm spending money on this, this, and that, but we're talking about a shirt yeah. and we're talking about postage on that shirt. And you do that once a week, maybe you spend like, you know, 60 to $80 a week, which might be a lot for some people, depending on who wins the shirt and where you're sending it. Right. If it's long Island, it's one thing. If it's Australia, it's another, another. but now that 
that person's wearing that t-shirt in another country, you know, and that's invaluable. So we do giveaways and, and I appreciate your feedback because again, you could sell, 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 but I know people whose sites I go to are Facebook pages and things like that. And that's all it is, is sell, yeah. sell, yeah, sell. Yeah, and, it's sort of like, and we've been very fortunate, you know, in no time we've managed like now on our Facebook page, we're like almost 11,000 people that are, that are following us, you know? And so I appreciate the feedback because it's become a really important part of, of running a tour company, which years ago wasn't. Yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah. we, we managed to have this extra tool now, right? And it's interesting, the conversations I have with folks is it's like, well, now you have this extra tool to use. What's the tool costing you, right? That's a whole nother part of your budget now. Yeah. And then you say, well, I can't spend that kind of money. Would you like to spend those hours doing that yourself? Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Got to outsource it. We are able to track the, the results because, you know, from time to time you analyze how much you're spending. And I spoke to my SEO guy and I said to him, should I be spending less on SEO on, on social media? What do you think? And he says to me, he goes, first of all, I've never seen the kind of results with any of my customers as far as social media and the traffic he goes and And we've literally figured out that you're making this much, which maybe either matches or comes a little under what I'm paying Allison, let's say, but then how much of that, because of what they read on Facebook is going directly to our website or maybe purchasing somewhere else. So we, we have the numbers that shows that it's actually helps and we haven't had to be pushy about it. You know, we've actually cultivated a relationship. Could I have done that by myself? No. A few years ago, if you had asked me to spend this kind of money on someone to do that, I'd be like, you're absolutely out of your mind. I'm not giving up that part of the business. That's me. I have to speak. I can't. If I, I did, and when I did, I was detrimental to my own business, to my own progress. No, it comes across. It's fun. I like the, the, the mentions. I love the photos. And as we wrap up here, I know I've been waxing lyrical about your tour, and that's because I thoroughly enjoyed it. And what I particularly enjoyed was just the level of knowledge. I know we've talked a lot about Paula today, and I hope your other tour guides forgive me, but obviously I was with Paula today. I don't think there was any questions she got. She got random questions, everything from how old was Gene Hackman in the French connection to what's that big oblong (laughs) building on Governor's Island. She oh, that's the air duct for the tunnel. She knew her stuff on all levels, not just... And, and that's the difference. When you're on a tour, when the tour guys really know their stuff and they're passionate about it. And I couldn't believe her passion for Staten Island, by the way. She really loves <laughs> Staten Island, doesn't she? <laughs> uh, no comment. Uh, so, uh, Tony, any, any final words when we wrap up for our listeners? I hope that if folks come to New York City, they'll consider taking a tour with us and just seeing how much Brooklyn has to offer from, you know, the foods, the neighborhoods, yeah. the landmarks, the movie locations, um, and, and how much it's, it's just as much a vital part of New York City as yeah. any of the other five boroughs. Well, what I, what I didn't say at the start of this was I lived here in New York City, Manhattan, for almost four years. And that whole time, I only went to Brooklyn once, <laughs> and that was on a really bad day. I never went over there. I did go to Coney Island to watch the New York Cosmos. I was a big New York Cosmos wow. fan. So wow. I'd go over to the park wow. to watch those guys play. Yeah. But other than that, I've spent more time in Brooklyn today than I did in the four years I live here. So That's thank awesome. you very much Thanks for that. Thanks so much, Shane. Thank you. And a big thank you to Tony Muir for your honesty in sharing your story. It's not always easy to share low points in our businesses. I uh, also want to thank you for your generosity in giving up almost two hours of your time on a Friday afternoon to share your story with all of us tourpreneurs who are out there. And I know there are many tourpreneurs listening in today who have endured some of the challenges you have, or maybe they're running out of cash and they don't know what to do. And I really hope that your interview gives them hope and sustenance to carry on with their tours. If you enjoyed today's show, what do I mean if you enjoyed today's show? I'm sure you enjoyed today's show. Please help me spread the word about this podcast because I know, we know, there are a lot more tourpreneurs out there that would draw a lot of inspiration and motivation from hearing from other tourpreneurs. Please do consider sharing today's episode with your friends, colleagues, and peers in the industry. Show notes can be found at tourpreneur.com forward slash 19. Forget about it. Arrivederci. Until next time. Thanks for listening to the Torpreneur podcast. Be sure to visit torpreneur.com to join the conversation and access the show notes, including links to the resources mentioned on today's episode. This is Torpreneur.